RIP Pitchfork, man. RIP Pitchfork. This is courtesy of Variety. Pitchfork is being folded into GQ as Condé Nast seeks the best path forward for the music publication. The article says as follows. Condé Nast is merging with Pitchfork, the digital music platform, sorry, publication it brought in 2015 with the men's magazine GQ, a move that will result in layoffs at Pitchfork, including the exit of the editor-in-chief Pooja Patel. Anna Wintour, um, Anna Wintour, Condé Nast Chief Content Officer and Global Editorial Director of Vogue. Yo, she sounds like, doesn't that sound like the title of fucking Kim Jong-un? Has she got so many fucking titles? Doesn't that, no, oh my bugging. Let me, let, hold on, let's, what is Kim Jong, doesn't it, isn't it, isn't Kim Jong-un's official title? Yeah, like Supreme Lord. Why has she got a name like that? <laughs> Her title. Kim Jong-un sounds like Supreme Lord of North Korea. Anna Wintour. Condé Nast Chief Content Officer and Global Editorial Director of Vogue. She's your boss of boss, 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 right? Fucking hell, no wonder she makes people so scared. Look at that title. Like, it's she's basically Kim Jong-un, like, working for Condé Nast, essentially, right? She's Condé nast on. <laughs> Look at that title. She's fucking Condé nast on. That's what she is. She's, con she's Condé nast on, right? Anna Winter Jong-un. That's what she fucking is. That's crazy. I just realized that now. Let me just zoom in so you can see this. Look at that. Look at the look at the look at the rel look at the, how similar their fucking titles are. Don't you find that fucking hilarious? Look at that. Kim Jong Un, Supreme Leader of North Korea. Anna Winter, Conde Nas, Chief Content Officer and Global Editorial Director of Vogue. That's absolutely wild. Continuing. Announced changes in a memo to company staff on Wednesday. Pitchfork has, cult um, has cult cultivated a brand of geared around music criticism, um, doling out both generous praise and withering pans. It was founded in 1996 by indie music fan Ryan, Schreider, Ryan Schreiber. Um, today we are evolving. Hmm, I wonder where he's from. Um, today we're evolving over at Pitchfork. No, evolving our team at Pitchfork's team structure by bringing the team into GQ organization. This decision was made after a careful evaluation of Pitchfork's performance and what we believe is the best path forward for the brand so that our coverage of music can continue to thrive within the company. Both Pitchfork and GQ have unique, valuable ways that they approach music journalism and we are excited for the new possibilities together. She added the organizational changes. Some of our Pitchfork colleagues will be leaving the company today right we'll be leaving i find that phrase funny they don't want to leave you're making them leave so it's not really leaving you're basically firing them but these days you have to like treat everybody with kids gloves and not make them feel sad but i, f I find that more insulting than just saying firing right um da -da -da -da. a rep for Condé Nast did not inf did not have information of how many pitchfork staffers will be let go winter's memo about pitchfork changes was first reported by simafor's max taney now some thoughts regarding myself um it's a sad day in music to be fair because i remember discovering pitchfork you know back in the day when i was going through my little hipster era hipster phase indie bands all this malarkey right going to fucking loads of free vice events and all this sort of shit right be listening to bombay bicycle club and all that nonsense right two door cinema club that's the kind of era that i remember listening to fucking oh viewing pitchfork or maybe that era when i was listening to like lightspeed champion blood orange um i can't think of anybody else i'm, I'm thinking of um uh i can't think of anybody but anyway um the killers the strokes all that sort of stuff right so i think they did a really good thing in terms of providing a platform for that kind of hipster very musically obsessed nerdy point of view i think that's very important especially music nowadays with it being commercialized with it being really kind of neutered with it being kind of nerfed with it being kind of bought out with it being kind of commercial i've said that already whatever it may be i think it's important to have a platform where you can highlight and be very specific and be very detailed and be very nerdy when it comes to music coverage unfortunately for some reason over the years people have probably stopped wanting that I think that's probably why we are where we're at. Because as great as I think Pitchfork is, and as important as those reviews were, both good and bad, for artists and for the culture and for scenes again, because I think in general, the Pitchfork um, you know, decimal point scoring system basically was the reason why people maybe started their own platforms, had their own YouTube channels, started their own publications as a reaction against Pitchfork. So they've basically contributed and basically been a content or an industry catalyst that people probably don't understand until maybe loads of years have gone by. But at the crux of it, they weren't making money. 
I think in life nowadays, especially living in a post pandemic world, it's very black and white now because I think the pandemic and the lockdown kind of reminded us in what is important, especially when it comes to business. And the most important thing for a business really is to be somewhat profitable. Now, I'm somebody that's a bit utopian. I sometimes think, especially being an artist at heart, I think it's important to have things that exist just to exist, that don't make any money, just for the sake of it, just for the vibes. Like there needs to be a guy living in every seaside town that brings in this fresh fish, cooks it at the beach for you, right there in front of you and gives it to you. And sometimes maybe sells it at a loss just for the experience. He doesn't need to be Jeff Bezos level of an entrepreneur. He just needs to be there as a symbol of like what that life could be like as a representation of that beach seaside town that he lives in. That person needs to exist. They don't always need to open a fucking food truck and fucking franchise and have a fucking source. That's not important. It's important for that person to just be there. So I think Pitchfork is the same thing. Pitchfork needs, exactly, as um, El, um, as a El Mace, as a El Me says, Pitchfork is necessary. So that's the sad thing about it. Like We don't have necessary things just existing in culture for the sake of it they all have to make money so if that's the case then pitchfork was destined to fail because unfortunately they weren't able to make money even when they tried to pivot into pop when they tried to be a bit more commercial and cover things more in a commercial way even when they tried to go a bit balls to the wall with hip-hop and try and fucking you know intellectualize fucking sexy red it still didn't work so maybe they tried to be all things to all people and it failed. Maybe if they were hyper-specific, that would have worked. But I think at the crux of it as well, and this is again a, a, the bane of capitalism, is that I also think, and again, maybe I'm giving the guy too much credit, but I think Elon Musk firing, what, 80% of Twitter staff when he bought the company was proof that you don't need a lot of people to successfully run something now maybe it's not running well twitter you can you know x you can talk about how it's it's fallen off whatever it may be but the fact that that place is still going and it's got like 10 percent of the staff that it originally have i think it shows you that a lot of these companies just had bloated staff to just you know for the sake of another round of investment having worked in startups myself i know what that thing was about whereas every year they wanted to basically grow and show that the company was growing and one of the ways to show it's growing was by hiring more staff. I don't know why that was, but it's a really backwards way to kind of, you know, legitimize a person's business to see if they're making money. But one of the criteria for giving a company investment is like the employee numbers ramping up. But obviously when the employees numbers ramp up, usually again, I haven't owned the business, but I would imagine the more people you add to your team, the more problems come about, um, the more maybe focus goes away from the actual core, you know, objectives of your company. And maybe the more, the the, the less of the, the quality kind of decreases over time, unless you obviously, you kind of focus on this, but it's just hard to kind of, you know, have control direction across so many different fields or areas of the business with so many different individuals. It's so hard to do it. But I think Elon basically proved that you can get away with running those companies with 10% of the staff. So I think a lot of people took notice of that and just, economically financially we're just in different times now people just can't afford to be you know paying people certain salaries when the site itself isn't making much money like imagine what they were paying out in salaries at pitchfork every month to freelancers to salary people it must have been insane compared to what they were getting in in terms of ad dollars so it wasn't making any sense in that regard so i completely get that but on the flip side if you work for pitchfork you can't be too um you know surprised by it because i think the writing was on the wall from the prevalence of like newsletters on Substack. like i subscribe to this one guy called uh, the first floor i forgot what the writer's name is but i'm always checking out his Substack. i'm not i'm not even a paid user on there i just check out some of his links and stuff and read some of the blurb the blogs he puts out and he's an incredible writer and he covers all the stuff that i like to listen to in terms of dance music right the first floor on Substack. but a lot of people have basically pivoted in to first to the first floor a lot of people pivoted into the first floor a lot of people have pivoted so so for, to Substack because it's just a better way to kind of you know follow people that you're into um especially when a musical opinion and that subscriber model uh, empowers or allows the writer to continue writing about hyper specific interests like that guy that writes the first floor usually only writes about electronic slash dance music slash clubbing stuff adjacent that's all he's focused on he's not going in writing about taylor swift he's not writing about the new drake record he's hyper 
focus on that one little niche. And he can do that because of Substack, because he's got fans who are paying him $5 or whatever minimum to take that, to kind of keep that kind of stuff going. But with Pitchfork, the only thing that you really would listen or watch or check out Pitchfork for were the reviews, right? Nothing, I don't know, maybe you'd, you, you'll check out their Sunday in review section or whatever, maybe, or maybe you go there for the, for the news in general about latest, you know, festival lineups and shit and who died, um, you know, what person in the band is leaving because of a sexual abuse claim or something, but that was it really. You didn't really probably discover loads of music through there. Uh, maybe just with, again, with the album recommendation thing. So if that's the only section that people are checking out, I would hate to think how much money they weren't bringing in every month. It must have been obscene. And having heard certain editors, like I've heard an editor the other day, an editor for some platform, I think it might have been like the New York or the Atlantic or something. He was like, oh yeah, I've been working a decade plus in this industry. Um, and he basically said he works, a de he's been working a decade plus as a freelance writer, right? Earning, you'd reckon, a decent salary, especially living in Washington, which if I'm not mistaken, is one of the most expensive cities to live in in the US. And he was saying he's been working a decade plus as a freelancer, having his own schedule from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. <laughs> most days. Imagine, he wakes up at fucking 11 p.m., 11 a.m. in the morning, maybe later, gets out of bed, gets to a coffee shop, types some words and goes back home. And he's making a decent salary doing that. So imagine all those people who were making that type of money consistently all those years. You know, you have to have known the writing was on the wall. That wasn't going to last forever. So, you know, as much as I'm sad for the people that Pitchfork, I think, you know, I think they're aware of how it's ending. I'm just more sad that we don't live in a society where you can just have thing exist just for the sake of existing. They don't always have to make money. There's, and the fact that it's going to be folded into GQ, the fact that it's going to be a drop-down section of a menu, or it's going to be a little tab at the top of the screen, is really sad, especially if you've seen the level of writing on GQ. The level of writing on GQ is fucking shit. So they have all these fucking crazy payola articles from certain brands. You know, it's just nonsense. So to have Pitchfork, who kind of credit themselves for having really nerdy, hyper-obsessed, controversial takes on music be absorbed into pitchfork it basically means it's going to be nerfed out it's going to be worth reading it's going to be type obviously completely shit but you can't be too surprised if you're a pitchfork employee the one thing that was funny was this article headline courtesy of variety anna wintour kept her sunglasses on the entire time she was telling pitchfork staffers they were getting laid off <laughs> I find this hilarious because this is the greatest example of the clash between people who work a regular job and people who work in fashion. If you work in fashion, this is this is not a surprise to you, right? Because Anna Winter has got this kind of mystique. She's got this image about her. The glasses are part of her brand. It's no surprise that she would be in a meeting with glasses on. She probably doesn't really take them off that often unless she's, you know, whatever. So if she's out publicly or whatever, maybe they're just always on. It's part of her fucking look. The bob, the fucking, you know, the face that looks like it's been hit by a sandblaster and the fucking, you know, and the glasses. It's all part of her image. But regular people that work a regular job, seeing somebody firing them with a pair of sunglasses. Imagine if I'm f doing a Zoom call with my employees with these fucking clout goggles on, <laughs> right? With these Playboy Carty clout goggles on. I'm out here saying, hey, we have to make the tough decision of letting some of you guys go um you know you'll be getting the confirmations of your packages <laughs> in the next couple of days <laughs> that is so horrible right doesn't even have the fucking respect to look you in the eye text them off and imagine especially on zoom you can barely see people especially if you've got a million people and they're all they're little kind of fucking square top of your screen if she wanted to she could look down this whole time but she doesn't she just keeps them on absolutely heinous but let's read the article it says anna winter calling that's long time fashion um uh, it's famous for seeing the style, trading out the glasses. Indeed, Winter take in Winter didn't take off her sunglasses the entire time she met with employees of Pitchfork this week to tell them that she was losing their jobs after Condé Nast decided to sub uh, subsume the music criticism site into GQ. One absolutely bizarre detail from the week is that Anna Winter, seated indoors at a conference table, <laughs> did not remove her sunglasses while she was telling us that we were about to be canned. This indecency we've seen from upper management this week is appalling. It's unclear whether Wintour's reported decision to not to remove her eyewear during the meeting was a deliberate <laughs> fashion choice or rather a way to avoid um, having to look at Pitchfork employees in the eye. Rest of Condé Nast did not respond for request of comment. In 2009 interview with 60 Minutes, Winter offered an explanation for omnipresent sunglasses. They are seriously useful. I can sit in a show and if I'm bored out of my mind, nobody will notice at this point they've become really an armor. 
So she explains it there, basically. She explains why she, she didn't take off her sunglasses. But, you know, with these articles, you have to keep clicking. You have to flopping keep clicking. But, yeah, solidarity and love goes out to everybody at Pitchfork who lost their jobs. I really do feel bad for you. Um, and I really do hope you land on your feet. And, obviously, there's loads of avenues now you, where you can kind of do a lot of coverage on music and stuff. If you've got a decent following, you can obviously have a sub stack, start your YouTube and shit. But, you know, maybe that's not the time to think about those type of things because you just got fired. But um, keep that in mind. Keep that in mind.